How's it going, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of Debate Night. Got a lot of fun things to talk about and some great analysts as well. But before we get into tonight's show, we got a quick word for from the sponsor of today's episode, and that is Manscaped. So, all right, guys, it's the best time of the year. Football is back. We're talking NFL Sundays, college football Saturdays, and that glorious grind of fantasy football lineups. This is where your inner GM comes alive, setting the perfect fantasy roster, screaming at your TV, and making last-minute waiver moves that either make you a hero or the guy everyone ridicules in the group chat. But listen, while you're over there making sure your fantasy team is dialed in, don't let your personal grooming become the guy that gets left on the bench. Let's be honest, nobody wants to fumble their grooming routine. That's where Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0 Ultra comes in, acting as your all-in-one grooming playbook. From keeping things sharp down below with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra to taking care of those rogue nose and air, ear hairs with the Weed Whacker 2.0, this is the lineup that will keep you looking and feeling like a champ on and off the field. You can join over 10 million men that trust Manscaped worldwide and get ready for kickoff by heading over to manscaped.com and using code debate night for 20% off plus free shipping. Listen, the all in one grooming kit is incredible. The performance package 5.0 ultra is your complete grooming playbook. It handles everything from below the waist maintenance to taking care of those nose and ear hairs. Consider it your winning lineup, helping you uh, be clean, confident, and ready to dominate your fantasy league. Uh, It comes with the lawnmower 5.0 ultra groin and body hair trimmer. This is the franchise player of your grooming roster with precise trimming capabilities. The lawnmower 5.0 ultra is built for performance. It's reliable, efficient, and gets the job done without fumbling. If you want to check out all these things that come in the package, including two free gifts um, and the Weed Whacker 2.0 ear and nose hair trimmer, you can go to manscaped.com. Use code debate night for free shipping and 20% off your order. That is manscaped.com. Use code debate night for 20% off your order and free shipping. Make sure to check out Manscaped. Thanks again to sponsoring for sponsoring this episode. But without further ado, let's introduce our guest tonight. Um, somebody who's not really a guest, somebody who's just basically uh, a pillar of the show. I'm the, uh, what's, the, what's the Vegas thing? I have a, um, residency. I have a residency. Your residency. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, last week we were talking about Woods Golf and, you know, some of the t- comments here, man of the people, you know, the top comment said, no, they are the best thing about disc golf, talking about Woods disc golf. What's bad about wooded courses on the Pro Tour is how they cover them. I mean, I agree with them. I think most wooded courses on the Pro Tour are covered terribly, but at the same time, like, can they cover them better? I don't know. Gavin also said, I'm a huge disc golf fan, but absolutely can't stand watching open courses. The biggest viewing pleasure is watching a disc weave through the air and turn through tight corridors. Heiser Fest courses take watching the entertainment flight, the entertaining flight of the disc completely out of the equation. And so, I mean, we did have that contrast this week between, you know, a course like Deglo, where a lot of the holes are open um, and courses where we play in the woods. But, uh, you know, Again, like I'm what no spoilers. I'm watching Hunter break 68 right now. No spoilers. I know the new London so well that it's so easy for me just with one camera angle to know if it's a good shot or not. And I was talking to some other guys this week, this past week and saying how it's crazy how like watching the European tournaments this week where like I didn't go to Europe. I didn't play in those tournaments. I've never played those courses. How much boring it is watching tournaments on courses you don't know because of how bad the coverage is of those courses because you don't really know what you're looking for you don't really know it's a good shot you don't really know it's a bad shot you don't really know anything yeah. um it's a it's a completely different experience watching courses that you know well and watching courses that you don't now what can the disc golf pro tour what could dgn do i mean that's something that we can maybe debate at a later time but that is definitely something that you need to be looking at because getting these courses well-known most PGA tour courses I've never played, but I know I'm pretty good based on the coverage, based on the stories, based on all the information that is out there on them. I think that's one thing that's lacking right now with the pro tour. Well, it certainly helps when the commentators um, know the course as well, which isn't always the case. But uh, we will be talking about some course design later because there was some comments uh, posted this week from some pros and uh, we'll be digging that back up. Uh, Lucas is also joining us today. Yeah, man of the man of the people. Brody, you're so right on the Evelina FPO putting debate. It's not even close. Man of the man of the people. I just Um, speak facts. (laughs) Just facts. Uh, And then Gary, man of the man of the people? Maybe. I don't know. Um, I'm getting back from a a podium finish at an A tier this weekend, so I'm feeling good. Whoa, whoa, Um, whoa, whoa. 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 Whoa
That's right. Uh, three rounds at Maple Hill was a blast, but um, just a huge shout out to Owen, Flavio, Steve, Ben, and JT, best card mates uh, I think I've played with in a long time. Just made the weekend very memorable. What tees did you guys play? Uh, we did blues, diamonds, and blues. Okay. What what is what what's the it, it goes that, gold yeah. gold the diamond is the FPO layout. So it's oh. the like the FPO. What's blue? Cl- closer than that? Blue no, so blue is uh in some cases blue actually goes to the gold tee pad and and adds a par stroke to it. And in oh, some cases blue is a different angle to the diamond. So blue and diamond Ooh. are kind of I think they got a lot of layouts out there. They, yeah, they, do. They, they give you a lot of ways to play that course. That's sure. a ton of fun. That's sweet. All right, cool. Um, and Mike's here. Mike didn't podium in an A tier, but he ran one. I did. I ran an A tier this week. And I, uh, today is the most I've sat down in four days. So I feel pretty good. Uh, it went well. I think we had like 60 players. So shout out Jonathan Fletcher for taking that down. 1500 bucks. Nice. Wow, you can see cool. the emotional and physical toll written all over Mike's face of what it takes to, to run a, a good disc golf tournament. Um, yeah. If you're around Hunter during a week where he's running a tournament, it is like the most stressed out and exhausting is mostly from answering people's emails. Oh. Um, that, <laughs> that is a very large part of it for sure. Um, all right, let's get into our first topic of the night. So Gannon Burr has now swept the disc golf pro tour plus events, winning all four and continuing his dominant season. He's also set the single season earnings record already, which is already only going to continue to grow as season goes on. Heck he might hit 200 K this year. So, is the sky the limit for this guy? Do you view Gannon as the next goat in the making, or are you much more conservative with his expectations given, given the young age of his career? When you think about Gannon Burr and you think about his potential, where do you kind of place him? Because I know somebody who has seemingly unlimited potential it can be difficult to, to kind of gauge that. So I'm curious to see where you guys are at. Uh, Brody, what do you think? Well, first, I mean, I think we got to address the alpha in the room. The, the scuttlebutt that's been going around is Gannon can't win uh, three-day tournaments. <laughs> Yeah. He's only won one Beaver state fling. And was that even a tournament? I don't know. Um, so no, but in all seriousness, like Gannon is on a different playing field than some of the other younger players that we have seen, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw them out there. Alden Harris is a good example. We have seen great things from Alden Harris at times. We thought he was kind of going to be the next one coming up. And he's fallen off this year a little bit, right? The consistency of some of these younger players, Anthony Barella, another one we've been saying for a while, he's going to be great. He's going to be great. He's going to be great. What happens beginning of the season? He's incredible. We're all saying, Hey, this is what we've been saying. Where has he been the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, last couple of events, right? So the consistency of a lot of these players is really tough. There are really only a handful of guys on tour that are cons- as consistent as Gannon Calvin it being one of those. I think the other one that you can throw in there is Ricky. Those guys, you know, are going to be at the top for countless tournaments. It's not going to be something where, Oh, that's cool. They're in the top 10. I think Simon, you can also throw Simon in the mix too. Obviously sometimes he takes some weeks off. He gets a little rusty, but he's always up there. I mean, I, I think Gannon over what he has shown the last several years, it's no question. As long as he says stays injury free, I think he's going to be around for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly the consistency is, is a big part of his success right now. Lucas, what do you think about Gannon? Yeah, I'm definitely also on board the Gannon hype train because we see consistent improvement too. It's not like he skyrocketed onto the scene Uh, and just started dominating and his stats demonstrate this, I think really well. So over the past two years, uh, I looked specifically at C1 regulation and C2 regulation, which are considered two of the more important stats uh, in the MPO field. Um, In 2021, he was 37% C1 in regulation. 2020, sorry, 2022, he was 37%. 2023, he was 43% C1 in regulation. This year he's 47%. That means he's increasing 10 percentage points in two years time. That's really great. Especially when you consider that the courses are getting more difficult. Second C2 in regulation. He went from 64% last year to 70% this year, 64% last year. This demonstrates how the course are getting more difficult. 64% last year was 27th in MPO. Uh, This year, 64% would be good for 15th in MPO. And at 70% this year, Uh, That means he's in first for that category, 70.6%. So this becomes even more impressive when you realize, uh, again, that the courses have gotten harder. 
C2 is one of the stats he's gone down in a little bit, but I think we can attribute that to the putters. So I definitely think Gannon will continue to improve as he's already done uh, and be around for a long time, as Brody said. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely not a lot of times you can look at a player who's already at such a high level at such a young age and, and point to that idea that he is still going up. He hasn't had a season worse than the one before it yet. Um, Gary, what are, your, what are your perceptions on his career and where it's headed? Yeah, so one dominant season a GOAT does not make. Um, everyone kind of quotes the 2015 Macbeth season, uh, but you got to look around that season. In 2010, Macbeth won his first ever A-tier or greater event as a pro. The next four years, he won three, five, nine, and ten wins, respectively, and then he hit 2015, the banner year. But he followed that with five, eight, eight, and 13 wins in the next four years. If he doesn't win this year, it'll be the first year since 2009 without an A-tier or greater win. And that shows a pattern over time of both growth and consistency. So let's look at Gannon. In 2022, Gannon won his first A tier or greater as an MPO player. And then he had two other wins that year. Last year, he had six wins. This year, he's already at seven. Uh, we definitely can't name him the GOAT yet because there hasn't been enough time to show growth and consistency. But what he's doing now is typical GOAT behavior. Um, this season, I think, is going to be a defining moment for him that he can either kind of jump off of and create a legacy for himself or he can squander it. Uh, I don't think he's going to do that. I don't think anyone thinks he's going to do that. But also the money record thing isn't really a big deal to me so much because um, more and more money keeps coming into the sport. So I expect that number to keep going up. It's definitely a notch in his belt, but it's not the whole belt. Um, but here's what we can say for certain. Gannon is showing us what the new upgraded model of a pro looks like. Young players are looking at people like Gannon and they're seeing someone who's taking his game seriously, winning week to week, and having a blast doing it. In five years, Gannon might be the topic of the GOAT conversation for sure, but right now we can definitely say that he's redefining what a pro really looks like. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Certainly very promising. Mike, wrap it up for us. Where do you think uh, Gannon sits right now and where he's headed? Yeah, similar to what Gary just said, as far as like the money earnings, I, I don't really put much weight in that, just with like the influx of amount of money being available. Um, when we talk about goats in every sport, obviously we're thinking of two different conversations sometimes, total skill and then legacy slash resume. And if we're talking about total skill, I mean, Gannon might already have done that. He already might be the best player to ever played this golf in terms of total skill. But obviously legacy and resume has a lot to do. He's the best player right now, and it shows the more amount of golf you have, the more likely he is to win. With sweeping those elite series pluses, an extra round obviously is giving him opportunities to get up and really get to where, um, get to the point where it's obvious that he's the best player in the course. Uh, he already is the best player. He has some work to do. This is the first year he has a winning head-to-head -head record against Calvin and Ricky. Um, I think we can say the top three players, at least I can say, are, are Gannon, Calvin, and Ricky. So we're talking about goats. We're talking about Paul. We're talking about Ken Climo. When we think about who could really put themselves in that conversation, when I look at the field right now, Gannon's the only one who can do it. Calvin and Ricky are already in their thirties getting there. Uh, they obviously aren't doing well in majors. We all know that. So when we think about who's young enough, who's good enough and who has the opportunity to win the most majors, it's definitely Gannon. I mean, he has more major wins in the last two years than Calvin and Ricky have in the last eight. So I think, he obviously has a lot of work to do, but in terms of who has the potential to have that GOAT status in the future, it's only Gannon right now. Yeah, I think you yeah. left out a big name, too, the Isaac Robinson. Yeah, I mean... Three-time three major I, champion, last two years, back-to-back -back world champion. Yeah, I think that... I, that's he, almost another, won the, he almost won this tournament. That's another person that I think I thought about in terms of who has chances, but... When we talk, like, if we, other than majors, it's obvious Gannon has a better, um, and he's younger, he's had better um, results in non-majors, and I think, like, over the test of time, he's going to end up with, like, if you're telling me you think that he'll have more majors than Gannon, I'd have an argument to make. No, no, I'm saying, Gannon. when you were, you were saying, like, the people that were in that conversation was Ricky Calvin, I think you can throw Isaac in there, oh, too. Oh, for, for best right now. Yeah, I could agree yeah. with that. Yeah, I mean, he's right now. He, you, it would be tough to say someone's playing better than Isaac, uh, right now. Yeah. The one other Isaac. point. The one other point too for me is this isn't like I think his age, because you meant you mentioned the young age of his career. I think his age, rather than it being like a questionable thing about being the goat, in his case, it actually helps. I mean, this isn't like a nineteen-year-old LeBron James that we just have all these expectations for. We don't really know what we're going to get from him. He's already the best player in the world. Like, even mm -hmm. if he doesn't get better, he's still the best player right now and will be for quite a while, probably. 
So for me, the age is only helping his case. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, he's definitely it, – it's – he's it definitely – very quick to realize his potential as a pro disc golfer. Cause you're right at the level he's playing already right now, he's, he's dominating. So it's not like, it's not like you feel like there needs to be development, but like, you know, we had talked about and Lucas had mentioned, like the statistics are continuing to improve. And even as the season goes on, you, you see things improve from his game. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see just, just where he can get to and, and how that's going to work out. But um, let's move on to our next topic and talk about another player showing a lot of potential right now. Um, that's Holland Hanley. So Holland Hanley came through with a fantastic bounce back win after a tough finish to worlds and is showing great potential and growth this season. Do you think she has the highest ceiling in FPO at longer courses due to her combination of power and competence around the green is distance too much to overcome for other top competitors at courses like toboggan. I wrote this question because I, I I've noticed at certain courses that do allow distance to be a factor for FPO. I really feel like as long as she's keeping the disc in play, she feels like the player to beat. Is that, is that the consensus though? Is that what I want to know? Lucas, what do you think? Yeah. So just to tackle the last part, I don't think that we're to the point where distance is so important that other players can't overcome it specifically at the toboggan uh last year actually Owen won this event she's definitely not one of the farthest throwers in 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 fpo so um while distance is obviously something that's continuing to be more important uh, i think we saw that in mpo uh a while ago where there's almost two separate tours in terms of the west coast and the east coast and different players are in competition on the east coast versus the west coast because of distance. And I think we're probably going to end up seeing something similar in FPO eventually. Uh, obviously, being able to throw hard and throw far is a, an is going to be um, an advantage no matter where you're at. But I think specifically on open courses, with someone like uh, uh, Holland's ability, like you said, Trevor, if she can keep it in bounds, I do like her chances any given weekend just because she has the advantage of throwing farther than her competitors. And so with that said, uh, I think you have to look at other p- people like Ella, um, Cat Merch, Haley King, and, and then Ellie Ezra even a little bit as well. The, these players, if they can continue to learn to keep the disc in bounds, and if course improvement keeps putting an emphasis on distance for FPO, I think you could see almost an entirely different FPO field for a lot of the season in competition in future years. Yeah, it is certainly interesting to track that with the development of the FPO course design as well. Gary, uh, what do you think about Han? Yeah, like Lucas, I want to address the last part because it's the easiest part. That you know, Toboggan may be a big course, but it's hard to argue that distance is the factor when, like you said, own own one last year. She beat out Ella, who's who's definitely a no distance slouch, but the next per- close person was seven strokes behind her. And she finished fourth this year. I think distance at Toboggan can be overcome by exceptional play in all other categories. But you know, when talking about Holland and her potential ceiling, I think the first person that comes to mind that might fight her is is Evelina, because we know that her putting is bad, but is her distance and throwing capability so much better that putting doesn't matter i mean look at what happened at worlds but after kind of looking deep into statistics i kind of had to walk that one back because the gap between them actually isn't that large in in, in categories like fairway hits park percentage and c1 and c2 in regulation on the putting green though evelina is 41st in c1x and 37th in c2 while holland is fifth and seventh respectively in those fields i think given those stats i would agree that that Holland has the higher ceiling. And then the only other person you could talk about is Kristen Tatar, which I think when she's playing at her best, I don't think any course puts Kristen at a disadvantage. Um, But the main thing for me is also the attitude because here in the last two press conferences, here are two things that I've heard from FPL competitors at worlds. I heard 325 feet is too long to be for a carry for the field at D glow. I heard the Island isn't big enough for us. You know what Holland said? She said that FPO players talking about distance have things they can fix but choose not to. Um, so Holland's the kind of person who's willing to point out the issues, and she's starting to really take her game seriously. If she can just kind of overcome those final round jitters she gets, I think that mentality and her skill set are going to win every day. Yeah, yeah, certainly certainly looks very promising right now. Mike, how, how have you been uh, gauging it with Holland? Yeah, I'm going to kind of expand a little bit on the specifics of this question because I, mean, I think she has one of the highest ceilings at these longer courses. Obviously, she still throws in a fairly far compared to the field. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily the only reason that I think she has the highest ceiling at these longer courses and courses in general. I mean, there's certainly further throwers in the division, but as we've been already mentioned, Kristen's made it clear. You don't have to be the first thrower own for that matter, obviously has made it clear, um, at least in the current state, but we don't know what these courses are going to end up looking like. We don't know if 
these grumblings are going to convince the Discount Pro Tour to keep these courses shorter or if they're going to continue to get longer like the MPO. What really gets me excited about Holland is their focus and their consistency. She only has three events outside of the top 10, which is pretty much the best other than Kristen. Um, the reason I like Holland so much is it, I don't know about how it's talked about here, but like at least in my circles, one of the things that bothers me the most is kind of the like lovey-dovey nature of the FPO division. And that was shown in great length during Worlds when you have someone like Kat who essentially blew her chance at a world title, screaming, acting more excited than the person who won the world title. You know who didn't act like that? Prime Page, Prime Katrina Allen. Um, you know, even Kristen, yet she's friendly, but you don't see her going and jumping around and celebrating with someone who just beat her. And I looked back and I looked at Holland and she curved her way through the crowd. She kind of sheepishly gave Evelina a handshake and she rushed her way out of there. She has kind of that fierce mentality. Yeah, she throws far. That's going to be obviously an advantage. But I think in general, like she is the most competitive, at least at first glance in this division. For that reason, I think she has the most uh, the greatest ceiling in general. Yeah, that certainly helps move things along. Mike, Mike, the body language expert. I like that you went back and like got the instant replay. Um, Brody, what are your thoughts? Wrap it up for us on Holland Hanley. Yeah, I do want just to add to that. Like, I think there is still a lot of players that have that mentality of like, we're all in this together. You know, we all travel from tournament to tournament. We all live in our vans in parking lots. And so like, there is that kind of family, I guess you can say like vibe that is going through. And then obviously too, with like the manufacturers, that's also the vibe that they're trying to give is like, we're all one big family. When, when you see the stark contrast of some people that don't abide by that or don't believe in it, it kind of stands out a little bit. And I'm, I'm with you. I've, I've never been a fan of like watching sports and thinking that like everyone wants the other person to win. Like, I just don't think that's very entertaining. Uh, but in regards to Holland and her ceiling, like, I, I mean, I think um, the highest ceiling is, is definitely Evelina. Uh, the fact that like literally if she just puts decent, she wins pretty much every tournament she played in this year. So you can't tell me that she doesn't have the highest ceiling when she literally just has to improve on one aspect of her game. And she becomes the most dominant FPO player probably of all time. Now, like what is Kristen doing? I think that's a question that I don't know why we're not asking on this show because like that, like what is going on this year, right? From what happened last year to this year, like, I don't, I don't know what's, what's happening. It's, it is, it is kind of, kind of weird watching her play. The big thing with Holland though, and, and really what kind of won this tournament for her is she threw one shot out of bounds after round one. That's impressive. That's what got her to the W and uh, yeah, when she plays well, she can win. Yeah. I, I just find it mostly interesting. Cause like when I watch, you know, when I watch FPO, you'd see a difference in, and Evelina is one of those players. Well, but with Holland, just, how much distance she's able to take off of holes shots that she's just able to execute that other players are not. And I think with Kristen, even, you know, she's found herself in situations where I think that like, as much as she is talented throwing the disc, she can only do so much and has to kind of like play clean and have other people sometimes fall around her as well. And I think when she's been put in situations where she has to chase people down, that just hasn't really quite worked out. I mean, I watched her in toboggan playing in the wind and just really, to having that course get the best of her, just really struggling to to move the disc around that course. So I don't know. I, I find it in, that's why I talk about the ceiling at those longer courses. Obviously, yeah, Evelina's another player like that, but I I think they are they're just really head and shoulders above some others. But there's a lot of people that throw like in that same realm as Holland. Like Holland's not out throwing the entire field. Like Haley King throws far. Kristen no, throws I, far. I, I would yeah, I would say Pat there are others Merch. in that category, but she she Ella. seems it, she's just kind of the up and comer right now. Cause like we, we know at this point, Ella Hansen has been around long enough that we kind of know who Ella Hansen is on tour. Yeah. Holland and Ellen, Ella basically went on tour roughly around the same time. I, I don't think, I think Ella I, was around a little longer, but, but in any case, I think Holland has demonstrated continued improvement and I don't think she's like, plateaued yet whereas i think the other players you mentioned we have seen some plateauing because holland has gotten better like the last three well, i think she's improved around. other elements around her game more well, so yeah, her mentality her. is i think yeah, better than fair enough. Of that's what that you know that's why that's what i'm saying no, I, I agree I, and you might I, be right it looks like uh, it looks like she played some tournaments in 
2021, but it wasn't until 2022 that she started touring more picked full up a time. disc in 2020. Well, and when we mentioned people like Haley King, like that's great that she has this raw talent and stuff, but like how many chances are we going to give her before it's just not going <laughs> yeah. out? That's like, similar. Saying, these players is like, I kind of know who they are. Hall and Hanley so, is exciting but, to me because it's like similar to Evelina. We keep saying like if she could just putt, like how great she would be, but we've been seeing this for but year that, after that year. And, true, though. She, she would literally win every tournament if she could just putt. Right, but she can't. And she, and she, and she, well, well, I know, but that doesn't yeah. take that doesn't change the fact that she would win if she could putt. Right, but I, I, this I don't think Holland course. has any of those. Like, what if she could? It's like I think she's still everything is still on the table for her. Whereas I don't feel that way about a lot of the other players. Yeah, but I don't think distance actually was a huge advantage on this course for FPO. I I think it was less distance and more your like just certain particular shots like carries where you're into a headwind and I just noticed Holland having a lot less trouble making those shots than a Kristen Tatar. It probably definitely helps just because it, strength more than just raw distance. Yeah, when it's when it's gusty, it's always nice to be able to go to a more overstable disc and right. throw a three hundred foot shot. That's what I noticed shot. more. Right. Yeah, it, it, I, I would agree with you there. I mean, there, but here let, let's. Let's let's throw the uh, uh, let's talk about what's really happening. There are too many FPO players, and and there are some MPO players too that rely on like Heiser flips, rely on flippy disc moving right yeah. to left. And when you go out to Toboggan and you play in a bowl where the wind is constantly changing, like you're way better off throwing something that's super overstable that you know is going to finish left all the time. Totally. Then some of these holes, man, like we, we, you couldn't tell the wind. You literally totally. couldn't tell the wind. So yeah, I, I agree I, with you there. It's like she could just power up on maybe a more overstable disc. But yeah, this D course, distance. I mean, you look at this, like, let me just tell you some of these par four distances 426, 480, 419, 538, 390, 507, 526. Well, in fairness, five, all of the distances in that course are completely misleading because they're usually straight <laughs> uphill or straight down. Not a lot of these. Not a lot of these. I'm, I'm just saying, if you if you looked at where the FPOs, yeah. if you played the layout, you would realize. I, I'm I'm going to talk to Holland tonight on Tour Life. Obviously, this is in the future. I'm going to ask her what she thinks. I think the course is set up too easily. I think they set up the course to get scores similar to MPO, and I think that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, I I don't think that should that's not how they should set up courses. No, yeah. I think I think you're right though. When I when I watch a player like Holland, I'm not really thinking, "Wow, look how much further she is down the fairway." I'm usually thinking, "Look at how she just threw that stable hyzer while somebody else had to get a full flight out of their disc." And I mean, the amount of times I saw an FPO player try to throw a hyzer flip into wind and just watch that disc burn over, like that mm -hmm. that's a, that makes such a big difference in those conditions for sure. Well, I mean, yeah, it's also, it's also just speed too. A lot of these FPO players, if, and like I said, MPO too, like if you're only throwing 60 miles per hour as an MPO player, like you are going to struggle mightily when you start playing in the wind. It's just, it is, yeah. it's just what it is. It's a different game for sure. Um, all right. We're going to talk about course design. Uh, this was quite a topic going around Facebook. Um, so Eric Oakley recently made a post criticizing some of the modern course design for punishing players too harshly. That was one of his main gripes. And then also using artificial OB too often and not creatively <laughs> enough. He said he prefers the European courses much more. Um, so do you find any merit? Do you find merit with any or all of his sentiments? Are disc golf course designers leaning on OB too much or are Eric's complaints unfounded? Um, there were a lot of pros kind of chiming in on this. This has kind of been a, a back and forth thing. I think there's a, a lot to discuss here, whether it's, you know, is it just like the, the older pros just kind of being like, ah, we need to get back to the roots or is there really some new course design that isn't really creative enough and, and, and really just using the OB. So what do you think about this Gary? Yeah, I think two things can be right at the same time. Uh, first of all, OB can be used in a great way, and there are places where it should exist. I think a good example is the rough on the right side of hole one at Deglo, because that brush is impossible. And if that wasn't OB, I think pace of play would have some serious struggles. But I think OB also can be abused, and it is abused a lot. A great example, I think, is hole 16 at Deglo. It's a difficult shot already, and I don't think the OB island there is necessary, and I think getting rid of the, the all the OB mm. stuff would help avoid the stupid drop zone that had to be invented to stop people from taking the Simon Strat this year. Um, I think this argument is a prime example of where the future of disc golf is going because 
Um, we're seeing properties now designed to be disc golf courses and not disc golf courses designed around properties. Um, so re remember what we had with Tempeta. They used models with clay to design the mounds before they were put in. They ran hundreds of yards of drainage under the fairways. And courses in Europe are difficult because there are tunnels, gaps, landing zones, elevation, or elevation, elevation changes that if you don't play them properly, you're going to be punished. If you're not in the right angle, you're going to be punished. You don't need relentless OB to do all that kind of stuff. And that's why the beast being cycled out is going to be a good thing long term, because I agree that seeing pros play tough courses is fun to watch and we like to see them struggle a little bit. But newsflash, they accomplished that at Northwood Black and New London this year, and they didn't need relentless OB to make those things happen. I don't think that we should be making courses for the bottom 50 pros, but I think it's fair to ask U.S. courses to do better and be more thoughtful. And I think it's why several prominent tour courses won't be around in five years. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, Mike, what are your thoughts on, on this argument with OB? Well, one part of Oakley's take I do agree with is that when you put OB too tight on a bad shot, um, when you put OB on too close to a shot, a bad shot and a terrible shot gets punished the, sh the same. Like hazard zone, stroke and distance, I think some things could be done to make it more variable. But that being said, that makes me not agree with him because that would just make courses even harder. I mean, winners of these events are averaging like 9 or 12 under par per round. And I think when people talk about how these courses are too easy or, oh, man, we need to make these courses harder, we're kind of forgetting about other than these top 20 guys, people are struggling on these same courses as is. Like, Eric wasn't at the preserve, but he's 10-16 rated. And I looked at some of the people around that rating, and, and they were shooting like three down, one down, even at the preserve. Meanwhile, the winner was averaging 12 down. So these courses arguably need to be harder if we're trying to get scoring separation and Listen, I mean, Eric hasn't has averaged worse than 50th in elite series and majors this year. And I'm not trying to have a hate, a hate party on Eric, but I think the conversation is how to get these scores even lower or not lower, but more score separation and, and harder OB would be the reason for that. And Brody's mentioned this before. Like if all this OB was beautiful water, no one would be saying anything. We don't have that access at the moment. So OB, in my opinion, is fine. I mean, we're in this weird spot where if you're 10, 16 rated, really, I mean, you're like a top local regional pro at this point, but you're playing with these top, top players. So yeah, it's going to feel really hard when they're shooting 12 strokes better than you each round. But I mean, in the PGA tour, you don't have guys who win the local club championship playing with the same guys. So there's just too much of a separation. And I think we yeah. really should just be focusing on making these harder. I mean, that is kind of, there's always that to be said. Whereas like, yes, there are a lot of players getting clobbered by these same courses while other people are shredding them and not having difficulties. There is that disparity there. Uh, Brody, where do you kind of sit on this one? So here's the deal. Uh, a lot of these guys, it, it, it started happening right when I came on tour. I think courses started, they're trying to try to buff up courses. Uh, it feels like, um, because I've seen a lot of changes from, it, it seemed like there was almost like no changes for a very long time. And then basically a lot of changes year after year. Uh, I was playing with someone. And so you're, you're having people that have it going through, th through that. And I understand no one likes change. I get it. But I was playing with someone on my final round we pretty much had all shot ourselves in the foot, either round one or round two. We weren't going to make the cut and we're kind of just going through the motions, playing the round. And uh, we were like on hole 12 or 13. And he was like, gosh, you remember when this course had like no OB, how fun it was. You could just throw it wherever you wanted. That's the problem. Disc golf isn't supposed to be just fun. Like, yeah. Is it fun to go out and shoot 15 under? Sure. I guess. But to me, like the fun part really from a spectator side is seeing guys get challenged. If you start taking Gary, I would love for you to answer this question. If you start taking OB out of this and perfect example is literally watch the first couple holes of Hunter play new London in this break 68. If you haven't watched, he's terrified of the OB on the right. Guess who wasn't terrified on the OB on the right in the first few holes, everyone that played at worlds, it changes your shots. It changes everything. And I would love to hear Gary uh, rebuttal on how do you get a bogey on hole 16 without OB? We'll get to that in a second. Uh, first, we'll get Lucas's take on this, but then we will uh, hear from Gary on that one. So I think it's important to consider what exactly course designers should be trying to do when they're making a course. If we can define that, then I think that the OB hazard 
all of that stuff will come more into focus. So the three things I came up with, I think the course designer should be aiming for are making the course entertaining for people to watch, making players think and creating score separation. And I think right now the best way to do that in disc golf is by using OB hazard drop zones, whatever it is, all those things, islands, whatever it is that makes players think. I love what Brody just said. Part of the reason I've been able to have success uh, as a disc golfer is because I understand what miss I shouldn't make on a given hole. And if players are not having to think about what miss they shouldn't make and they're just able to throw it wherever, then that's in, that's, I would say 70% of the game of golf is having to consider what shot you want to throw that will not only end in a good result if you execute it, but not end in a bad result if you don't execute it. And so I think course designers going forward should continue to strive to do that, but make sure that it still stays entertaining. I think OB is still entertaining because I'm trying to put myself in the player's position to think about what they're going to throw. So I'm okay with OB. I don't think it's too punishing right now. OB is the best way to punish bad shots and reward good shots. And for that reason, I'll always be okay with OB being on the course until there's a new, better way to, to create shot separation, entertainment, and uh, mental challenges as a golfer. Right. With all the conflicts of interest we have right now with spectator experience versus woods versus, you know, resources and all these things, it does seem like the best solution we have. But, um, okay, Brody, what was your rebuttal now to Gary? You're asking him how yeah, he was, make- he was saying that he doesn't think there needs to be OB on 16, which there wasn't. Uh, there used to not be OB on 16. I would love to know from Gary how you actually would get a bogey on that hole without OB. So I, I didn't say that OB shouldn't be used on hole 16. I said that OB is a great example of how OB can be abused. I think there are ways you could utilize OB on that hole to make it effective. I think putting OB 10 feet behind the basket, we've talked plenty of times about how yeah. useless that can be. Maybe use OB lines to create a carry to to like a safe like a safe zone where maybe – uh, they have to get past a certain point, put the OB kind of on where that, that those front trees are to protect the the entryway. So that way, if you hit those trees and you don't think about your shot, maybe it falls OB. Like you could do things that way, but to wrap the whole area in OB because somehow the Pro Tour needs to have an island hole on every 16 or 17 on every single course. I, I think there's way, like, I think that's an over abuse of OB. Uh, they could do it differently. I don't want to so- see all OB eliminated. I want to see OB be thoughtful. So I, I think it makes sense. I think I think hole 16 it does make sense. The the problem with host hole 16 right now is the limbs are too it, it's a little bit too of a fluky tee shot where some shots are get through and like I think when you have that and this is where it kind of like you kind of look at it, right? Like if you have a 100 foot uh tunnel. If you have a 100 it's 100 feet from where you are to the basket. I think you can make that tunnel pretty narrow. Mm-hmm. If you have a 400 foot tunnel, I think that tunnel probably needs to get a little bit wider, right? Obviously mm-hmm. you can't be the same. So I think that's the problem with 16 is we see some shots kind of get held up by trees, fall OB, kick go OB or fall and be like 90 feet short. And we see others don't. Now I actually don't mind um, in this scenario. I don't actually mind OB behind the basket here. Why? Because the good shot here was 30 feet short. If we're all trying to aim 30 feet short. So if you go OB long here, Gary, that means you have missed your landing zone by 40 feet. Is that a good shot? I don't think so. So that's why I'm Mm -hmm. okay with it. I think also OB, OB uh, long also makes it to where like Gannon in the final round, he had to think, should I run this putt to try to make a birdie here? Or do I lay it up? It turned out it was a little windy. He had to lay it up because he knew if he would have ran it and gone OB, he would have gave an extra stroke to Ricky. So uh, to me, I like I like the way that the OB is shaped on that hole. I think the major issue is just the way that the trees are. And one of the big problems at Toboggan is they can't control the trees. They're not allowed mm-hmm. to trim trees. They're not allowed to take trees down. I think if you take that one tree down on the left, I think that hole becomes very exciting, very interesting. And it takes away the flukiness of a bad shot, being okay and an okay shot kind of getting wrecked, which is what we kind of have on that hole at the end. Yeah, I, I I definitely could vibe with that. I mean, obviously at the end of the day, you're you're the one who's played it. I mean, if I would have been to Deagle, I might have a different opinion of it. I definitely there are other courses where I might have a different opinion because I've been there. There are, but, some, um, there I'll, are some I'll, for I'll, sure. I'll I'll lean on your expertise there. One thing I find interesting is they mentioned um on Jomez that I guess there's an agreement where every three years 
they bring people in to trim the course yeah. and well, this was the third year. Yeah. So that's, that's why the thorns, a lot of people oh. were complaining about the thorns and stuff. They come in and they clear out all these, I can't remember what they're called. I like olives. They're, yeah. They're like, they're like evasive, like plants, like some places like yeah. actually will remove them all, but they let them grow up for three years and they take them out. So this was year three. So uh, shout out to all the, the spotters <laughs> out there. crazy. Yeah, shout out to mm. all the spotters. It was terrible. It was like if you were off the fairway, it was absolutely miserable. Um, last thing I'm going to say about OB again, for everyone that thinks like you don't need it, like how do you make hole 17 hard? Like are we assuming, mm -hmm. like are we believing in a hypothetical world that hole 17 doesn't have that OB on the left that Ricky throws that shot in the final round? Absolutely not. There's mm -hmm. no chance Ricky turns over his drive on hole 17 if the OB doesn't exist there. Like, the only be, reason that turns over is he's scared of it going OB left. And people will be way more likely to attack it even more aggressively by just throwing kind of straight at the pin. Because right now, they're throwing off to the right a little bit, so that way they're over inbounds as long as possible. Yeah. Whereas if you yeah. just see people without OB there, they're just launching it as far as they can right. straight at the basket. That, that I mean, whole sucked when there was yeah, no exactly. OB. It yeah. was really a long drive contest. Everyone yeah. just chucked it as far as they could. And then wherever it ended up, you're trying to get up and down. Like to yeah. me, that's, I don't think that's disc golf. People, that doesn't, people that doesn't show too skill. often. Well, people too often consider, I think the end result of OB, like the disc landing and going out of bounds rather than the psychological effect it has on the tee. Like you mentioned, hole one in new London is like one of the best examples where like, you're just not even going to try to throw certain shots because of its existence. And that's what OB really can do is it, it can shape the way people play whole three and, people and it gives them the option. The green. It People also go gives for the, the green, right? It also when there gives was no the option of risk and reward. Um, whereas it might not be there before. It might just be everybody. It only make it's, it goes back to the old adage of like, is there one choice to make on the T pad or is there three? And if you have OB, yeah. there's certainly going to be more uh, than one. Uh, I also, that, that whole year three thing. I mean, Crazy. if I'm not, you got to hammer the, the, the over next year in, in for strokes <laughs> under par, I guess, because now that we're in year one, there'll be, there'll be no brush. That's, that's hilarious. Um, okay. We got one final topic here, uh, before we get into our finals, this is a fan submitted topic. So we have made it all the way to the final few events and have yet to have a single playoff in the MPO division. Pretty crazy. Despite praising it for its parody most of the year. Is this stat merely an unrelated bit of chance or does the MPO division have more separation than we may give it credit for? Um, you can also kind of look at this regard aside from that stat and just kind of analyze the parody as you, as you wish as well. But uh, Mike, what do you think? Well, I, first off, I think it's silly to determine parody by how many playoffs. If someone wins by one, on the last hole versus tying and playing one playoff hole. I, I don't really see how this do with parody. Talking about parody, like what are we comparing it to? Are we comparing it to when if Ricky and Paul were in the field ten ish seven years ago, one of them won every time? Like clearly we have more parody than back then. Uh the average stroke distance or the average amount of strokes won by is like two point seven this year. I think it was like two point four last year. Um so nearly every event is close. There's been nine unique winners in M MPO this year in the 18 events, counting, you know, the regular uh, pro tour events and majors. Uh, I think that's a good, a great balance of parity with unique winners and powerhouses that you know can dominate the game and make it more interesting. As sports fans, we don't want true parity. We don't want every single person in a field or every single team in a sport to be exactly the same skill level. Like. I don't, people might say that, but they definitely don't. We want dynasties. We want powerhouses. We want the 2000s Patriots. We want the 90s Bulls. We want these teams to be better than everyone else. So when they do finally get brought down, it's more exciting. So for me, the parity is a good balance right now. One thing I do want to mention, though, is we always kind of talk kind of down on the FPO field of not having enough parity and stuff. But when we look this year, they also have had nine unique winners in those 18 events. And you could argue they've had more parity because they don't have a six time winner in Gannon Burr. So. I think both fields are kind of have a decent amount of parity at this time. Yeah, there there is definitely something to be to be said about that at this point. Um, great points there, Mike um, Brody. What do you uh, what do you think about the uh, the lack of playoffs and the parity in MPO? No, I think I think the parity exists in FPO now because Kristen's not. I just don't know what Kristen's doing this year. Um, but yeah, I I, I think there's kind of a silly question as well. Um, there's only maybe been a handful of tournaments where you know, someone going into the final round was expected to win. 
Uh, you know, a lot of these tournaments are kind of up in the air. You know, we had some flashes too of like players on second card, third card playing well and moving up into the mix. Like it was nice to kind of see Evan, uh, this past tournament kind of make a push, uh, throughout the final round there. And, you know, I mean, this last tournament, like it, it one, one extra foot here and there for Gannon on a couple of these throws down the wire and, and we're going into a playoff maybe a three person playoff. So I, the playoff thing, I think it's like really rare. I think the reason why we're not seeing it as much and the, honestly, the reason why we won't be seeing it as much in the future is courses are getting better. Score separation is getting better. If you put us all on a really, really easy course where we're all going to shoot 10, 12, 13, 14 under par, guess what's going to happen. You're going to get a lot of ties. That's just what was what's going to happen. Like when you put on harder and harder courses, the cream rises to the crop. The people that are playing well go to the top and everyone else kind of filters out. And so there's less people to tie. And that's all we're seeing this year. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Lucas, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I think that everybody kind of nailed it so far. Mike's point about um, the playoffs not being uh, the best measure of parity is a good point. And then Brody, uh, what he just said about courses are getting better. I think that really, when I was thinking about it, I think it really specifically boils down to the final holes being better this year. Uh, there have been, I think, a lot of two-stroke swing possibilities down the finishing stretch where there are two-stroke swing holes, but they're also difficult to get birdies on. I think hole 17 is probably the best example of this uh, at Deagle this past weekend. Like it's There's a two-stroke swing possibility, but you still have to throw two really great shots to get a birdie. And Ricky threw an okay drive. It was overturned, obviously, but it was okay. And then his second shot was too difficult because he was off by a little bit on his drive. And so I think that coming down the stretch, the course design has been getting so much better that people don't have the same opportunity. I think about Calvin a couple years ago at Las Vegas when he birdied like five of the last six holes to beat Kevin Jones, uh, that you just are not going to see that happen as much anymore because of the difficulty of the courses. And then also when you think about how people are playing down the stretch, people are getting more intelligent. And so down like Gannon laying up that putt on 16, I don't know if you see people do that a couple of years ago. And so the, the combination of players getting better, the cream rising to the top of there being like five to 10 guys that you really are counting on having a real shot at winning and the course design, specifically the layer course design down uh, later on in the course. I think all of those things combined have really created a little bit less parity in the field, especially going in the last bit of a, a tournament. I do think um, player decision-making coming down the stretch, like you mentioned is, is a very big part of the change. Um, Gary, what, what are your thoughts? Wrap it up for us. Yeah, the person who made this question, what season have you been watching? Because like at chess.com, Rick cut the lead by four strokes heading into hole 18 to push AB. At Waco, Gannon had to birdie 18 to win, and Luke choked that one. Uh, Austin, Antela had to make a birdie in the dark from deep to win, and he did. Uh, at Texas, Gannon went 10 birdies in a row to, and 15 down that round to chase down AB. Jonesboro, there were three people tied at 17, uh, tied through 17 holes in the last round. Beaver State came down to 18 and Luke's massive implosion. At the preserve, Klein eagled 18 to force Ricky to have to birdie 18. At Des Moines, Ham is choked, Matteo charged, and Gannon double bogeyed on 17. European Open, yet Gannon, Ricky, and Paul on the lead card. What more could we ask for as fans, really? I mean, Ricky, birdie 17, ties it up going to in 18. We had the big drama on 18. At Idlewild, Joey Buckets gets his first win, and Ezra charges from the chase. And then here at Deglo, Ricky chases down Gannon, and it comes down to the last two holes, and Gannon threw a roller on 18 to give Ricky a chance for reasons I can't even begin to figure out. Um, but what all these have in common, they're all decided by two strokes or less. Um, there were only three events this year that you could question the parody, and that's Portland and Ledgestone because Gannon crushed everybody, and OTB because it was Swenson Park and a board assault of tears. But this year we've seen numerous lead changes, final round surges, and final round collapses, and the talent's at an all-time high. So uh, while I'm at this, uh, I'm going to say the playoffs don't – they're not indicative of parody. It just means two people tied at the end, and that can happen in leagues without without parody. So, not to steal something from Brody here, but what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it certainly is a. Um, it is definitely more of a measure of probability than anything else. I do think the it is 
it is definitely interesting to measure kind of like some people's perception of parity is just how close tournaments are. And some people's perception of parity is just how often are there repeat winners versus new winners. But I, I think that we're still obviously getting a pretty good product. Uh, most events um, just has been, honestly, for me, I've just been more surprised uh, more than anything that we haven't had a playoff yet. Um, okay. We're done our topics. We have a tie for second place right now. So we're going to do a little tiebreaker, something real quick. Spelling um, bee. <laughs> Not no better than that. Well, listen, if you didn't, if you don't believe I was tempted, but I won't, I won't do spelling bee. We'll do something a little more simple. Um, so I'm going to name a player and then Lucas and Mike, you're each going to try to tell me as close as where they finished at Deglo as possible. And then the closest guest is going to move on. Oh, so yeah, cover your yeah, eyes. I'm, yeah. I mean, no wrong answers here. Well, there's a lot of wrong answers, <laughs> hundreds of them actually. Uh, okay. Are you ready? The player is James Conrad, Lucas, Mike. Who's going Lucas, first? You can guess first. Oh, we just, is it who's closest? Whoever is closest. Yeah, same player. Uh, you can just guess when you're ready. It doesn't really matter. 24th. 24th, okay. I'm going to say 45th. Okay, two very different guesses. The answer is 21st. Dang. So Mike was almost nice right comment. on it. Brutal. Yeah, that, I mean, that, I would not have guessed in that high either, Lucas. If I was just going off my gut, I would have said I would have gone much higher as well. So, all right, we're going to move Mike into the finals here, and we're going to do our final topic. Um, now, I know Mike is a big advocate of reset to zero. Is Gary also an advocate of reset to zero, or is Gary a, uh, I earned my lead, let me keep it? Hey, no shame. I'm uh, as we established. I'm the man of the man of the man of the man of the people here. Let's reset it to zero and let's go. Let's duke it out, Mike. All right, so let's let's reset those scores to zero, if you will. Um, he's so fast at that. All right, I got. I was mentioning this to Gary early after asking the uh, doing the group A, group B topic last week. I got addicted to it, and <laughs> it's probably going to happen like every other week for the remainder of this show's history, um, <laughs> because it's just too fun. So we did MPO. In this kind of themed question last week, we're going to do FPO this year or this week. So which group of players do you believe is most likely to win more combined majors in the next five years? Last week, you kind of had a consensus. I tried to tighten it up this, this week. So group A is um, some of more of the more established players here. We got Kristen Tatar, Owen Scoggins, and Missy Gannon. And then group B, we've got Holland Hanley, Kat Merch, and Evelina Solonen. So which of those do you believe is more likely to win combined, uh, win more combined majors in the next five years? Gary, I'll still let you pick if you want to go first or second. What would you like? Uh, I'd like to go first. Okay. Fire away, Gary. Yeah, this is definitely a great quote. I love these. This is a tougher one than last week, though. Um, so because you have to kind of look at each group. So group group A, I kind of have calling like they're the, the proven. You know, Kristen Tatar, I think most people would agree it's been a disappointing year for her, even though most FBO players would probably still kill for the season that she had. Um, but until she proves otherwise, I think she's going to be a threat still at all 20 of these majors. But I could see her winning one a year, and I'm, so I'm going to give her five. Um, Owen Scoggins has shown that she can adapt to a lot of different events. You know, her lack of distance can be a hindrance sometimes, but she's won on long courses before. And I, th I think it's because everything else was in top form that weekend for her. So if it's a long course and the putts off, I think she's kind of out of it. But given, given that and her age, I'm going to conservatively only give her one more major, uh, in that, in that five years, Missy. Where there's money, Missy will be also, um, hence the nickname. But I think she has a relatively solid game across the board. I don't think she seems to dominate necessarily in one category or another, despite leading the field in fairways hit. Um, but she's not really a boomer bust type of player. I, I could see her winning two majors. Uh, so that, I, that puts Group A at eight majors. The other group I'm labeling the potential. So Holland Hanley, like mentioned earlier, I think has one of the best ceilings in FPO, and she seems to be coming um, together with everything. And if she can work on finishing events strong, she could be a really big contender. And I think it's fair to say that she could win four majors in the next five years. I'm going to give her four. Kat is the most difficult one to call because she's showing increased potential. When she puts her game together, it tends to really work for her. But I'm not sure she has the experience down the stretch yet. So I'm saying the next two years are learning for her. And then I put her down for two majors in the three years after that. Evelina is going to go one or two ways. Evelina, as she is right now, is one of the best throwers of the disc in FPO. Also one of the worst putters, and her mental game is a bit of a struggle. I'd say Evelina right now wins two more majors. But 
if Evelina can go find herself a coach or a mentor and she puts in the work and fixes the putt and gains some confidence, I, I could see her winning five majors. So that puts Group B at 8 to 11, depending on Evelina. I'm going to say Group B is going to win more. But I think it's safe to say that the group of six are going to control the majors for the next five years. Um, okay. Could be a good one. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, quite a range there. So Evelina is the X factor for Gary. Uh, Mike, which group do you have and why? I'm with group A here. Um, Kat Ooh. doesn't feel like she belongs in this group of six. I just feel like it's a weird name to have in. I know she just came in second at Worlds, but she only has one win on tour, period. One win. And it doesn't feel like she's going to get over that hump unless something specifically changes. She has 23. A lot of that can change. Like, arguably, she may be coming into prime years. But for me, I don't know why we would assume she's going to win any majors when she really isn't winning any events. Uh, I I don't have her winning any majors in the next five years, like maybe a half a major, but again, she's won one event. So for me, I, I don't see where that's coming from. Evelina, she's 25 best thrower of the disc. She's won two majors this year, which was uh, off of a drought since 2018. Uh, she does finish better in majors uh, marginally than regular events. The problem I have with her is I think the field's going to catch up to her with her poor putting. Like eventually in these five years is a long time. And there's going to be people who get closer to her throwing the disc and are much better putters. We already see them. And, you know, we talk about ceilings, but at what point is it not your ceiling anymore? If it's just proven, you can't do something. She's had this issue for multiple years and she hasn't fixed it. So I'm going to give her three just be, or four rather, just because she does throw the disc so well. But I think those are going to be in the first one, two, maybe three years. And after that, I think she's going to struggle unless a lot of things change. That takes me to Holland, and, and she's kind of in the middle of this group. She is 30 years old. We don't need to worry about decline, but as far as physical uh, skills go, I don't think it's going to get really much better. Um, I do love her mentality. She only has two podiums in the last five years in majors. We're really heavily investing in what we think she can do. Um, I think that's a big leap of faith, so I'm, I'm going to give her two just because she hasn't really done much in majors yet. And all this hate on Kristen, I, I don't really need to talk about Owen. I don't think Owen's going to win any. Maybe one. Missy might win one, too. But all this hate on Kristen is, I think, is a little over the top. She still won the most events this year. She still finished eighth or better in every single event this year. And she battled a little bit of an injury, and she had some things going on. But to think that she's not going to win seven, eight more majors in the next five years doesn't really make a ton of sense to me when she's won six or she's won six in the last or excuse me five in the last two years so for me again this is one of those things where i think kristen might just beat everybody but if i give owen and missy one between the two of them and kristen eight then i have group a winning pretty easily okay okay yeah i i think um yeah do you I, gary do you have do you have any response to that i'll, I'll ask I think it's interesting because I think Kristen's the wild card on, on team a for sure, because if she comes out and she does what she did last year, that's one thing. But as the, as the feeling of her dominance, I think fades, which is why people have been competing with her better this year is there's less of a, there's a monster on my card with me and people are a bit more confident um, because I agree with the argument that I don't think that Kristen's necessarily gotten so much worse. The, the field is getting that much better. Um, but the other one is I don't, I know Evelina has had this struggle for a couple of years I just don't see her relegating herself to poor putting for the next five years. As just like Brody and Yuli were talking about, at some point someone's going to come along and be like, "Evelina, we can take this to the moon if you just work with me. If you just figure it out." And maybe she can go watch Yuli's uh, recent video he launched on on putting from short distances. That could help her out a bit. Uh, she's done this. I mean, there was it was either last year or the year before. All was standing next to her. They were putting together for hours i mean people have reached out to her people have tried to help whether it's mechanical whether it's mental like it and it hasn't just been a couple years like it's been longer she's never been a good putter but she's always been a good thrower and like i said she hasn't won a major since 2018 until this year mm -hmm. she needs a certain course to win majors right now she needs a course that you have to be an elite thrower and to rely on that and to just assume she's going to ma magically figure this out when this is her job and she'd be the goat if she could figure it out and that hasn't been enough motivation obviously i just don't see why we'd give her the benefit of the doubt in that yeah but paul, paul stood next to ab as he 10 cupped uh, uh european open a couple years ago but, sure, but like but, but I, she won but look at the event she won she won the bomber course worlds and she also won you know champions cup so she's she's diversified in the courses that she's able to, to be successful at so i and, think and, and there are events this year she did putt really well so i think it's there 
Really there. well is kind of a stretch. <laughs> really, well, really well is a stretch. Well, not, really, think, not really, really yeah. well. He, By her standards, well enough. Putting as bad as she has multiple times. Like, the barrier of entry to just be a below average putter is not far away from her. But she hasn't done it. And if she mm-hmm. hasn't done it, why would we think she would? Like, if I'm if I can't make a 10 foot putt for three years, why am I going to make it the fourth year? Like, she's either not trying or she yeah. has tried and she can. Both of those it, are bad options. It's, it's like the it's the infinite problem because you have a, a skill that is obviously not a physical problem. And so, therefore, it seems like the easiest fix because it it is in the scheme of it could just click one day. Right. Like it could just be that kind of thing. But also, you're right, Mike, like at some point you have to just accept it. Like this person just like putting. It is a thing that people can go their whole careers and not be good at. Like there, that is, that is definitely a thing. So yeah, I, when I wrote this down, I was not um, really sold on one or the other. I didn't really think about it much. I kind of just wrote them down, thought they'd be pretty even. And I figured I'll let these guys try to convince me of which group. And, and now that I've heard both your arguments, I would probably have to side with Mike on this one. I, I, I think only because Mike started waking me up out of a trance, I think a little bit. And I think we might, a few of us might be in right now, which is, I think we might be doing something to Kristen Tatar that we've probably done to other players before, where she did have an injury this, this, this year. She has missed time. Mm-hmm. She got married. I don't know. I, I feel like there's every chance that next year she comes out and is still really dominant. And we're just kind of like, huh? Remember when we thought that was kind of fading? Uh, I, and that's that's kind of where I'm sitting right now. What? I don't know. What? Uh, you have to talk about what's going on. I'm not going to yeah. steal Mike's time. Mike, go. Sorry. I'll talk after. I, okay. <laughs> well, no. Yeah. I mean, she's still the best FPL player. She's won the most this year. That's what I'm saying. She's- like in her in her awful season where she missed a lot of time, she still like has a player of the year resume. So it's like, I feel yeah. it feels it feels a little bit like reaching. Anyway, I'll use my what, time. Is super there, what quick. did I say? That was much- a lie. I'll let my, I'll tell you. I'll let Mike go though. <laughs> All right, am I good? Yes. And truthfully, I don't really have much to say. I barely had time to prompt, so I don't. Have a, I didn't think of anything to dance around on. I will say, looking back at it, it wasn't really necessarily the smartest decision to crash on the PDGA literally days before I'm running a, a PDGA A <laughs> tier. But they were very helpful. Everything was great. I will take my time to shout out all the people that helped me run the event, all the assistant TDs, all the volunteers, and it, it went, went great. So um, I don't know how many more events I'll be running in the future because it kind of was exhausting, but it was a great time. So I want to give everybody a shout out to help me. with. Let's go. Let's go. All right, Brody, what? I was gonna, first question, Mike, do you think more money should be going to the tournament directors than the PDGA? Uh, seeing how much we have to send the PDGA makes me sick to my stomach. That's yep. <laughs> yep. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, I wonder so, if tournaments, w- I, I bet tournaments would be run a lot better if the money wasn't going to the PDGA and it was going to, to people that was running the tournament. I mean, listen, if you're it's not, ven- if you're not vending your own event as a TD, the, the path to making money just doesn't really exist. Yeah. Now, if yeah. you're vending your own stuff, then you can make some money, obviously, but if you're not, I mean, and you look at how much you're giving the PDGA, even and even the money you give the PDGA still wouldn't like really put a dent in making it worth it from like an hourly perspective. Like you have to have some passion for it. But sure. Also, it, it definitely would it, help. Yeah. The only thing I got, so we had to pay double the price than you would have a B tier per player. And the only thing they did for me is I got the $50 insurance for free. That was the it's only so difference nice. between the C hey, tier so and nice. an A tier. Nice. Shout out oh. to the PDGA for making dreams come true. <laughs> um, all right, Trevor, my big issue is you, you actually, you have to just look at, um, at the finishes, right? Yeah. I, I know Mike said she hasn't finished more than uh, lower than the top eight. That's not impressive. I'm not impressed. I agree, I, I'm not, I agree with that. Yeah. Finishing a top 10 is not impressive. Um, but the thing that I think is really right now in FPO, it's basically win or bust, right? And really in MPO too, in a, in a sense too, it's, it's when is Calvin going to win next? When is Ricky going to, you know, sure. it's kind of a win or bust situation. Last year, she only went two tournaments. There was only two stretches where she didn't win back to back. So there was yeah. multiple stretches where she won multiple times. Then she would not win. And then the next week she would win again. There was only twice last year that she didn't win. And the next week she didn't win. 
This year, there's been a stretch that she hasn't won three times in a row. And now she's on a stretch of four tournaments in a row without a win. So it does feel like this is a lot worse. I, I get it. She's won more than anyone else. Yeah. No. But I, you got to compare it to what she was. She I, was like on this. Thi- we, yeah. It wasn't I'm like she was up here for 10 years. Right, right, and right. now she's starting to drift. Like I'm mostly she talking was going about it. up. I'm mostly talking about it in the in the scheme of this group argument. Like there's even even in a declining season, she still got a major. Like there's every reason that she could average two majors a season for the next five seasons. Like it's not, it's not insane to to believe that. But she wouldn't, um, she wouldn't, she shouldn't have won that major. She only won that major because the person absolutely had a, a, a atrocious that round. Happens in eighty percent of the FPL FPL, events, Brody. That, That's what I'm trying to say. Is we all saw Kristen last year as wait a second, she wow. is moving the field in right. this direction. But even last year, and a it's lot not of happening were handed anymore. to her on a silver platter. Look at Waco last year when Ella Hansen just sure. gave it to her. I agree, but there was also signs of dominance from her as. As well and what i'm saying right now is i she hasn't come out and said anything we don't really know but it is one of those things of like what is happening it, you have to ask the question of what is happening yeah i, I it's, it's I, not I, like there's three new players all of a sudden that are just all of a sudden like dominating like i think it's a wake-up call year i think it's a wake-up weatherman call year. one ter- one one tournament hasn't really been in contention since then you know it's not like it's not like we're seeing someone all of a sudden show up and dominate and now it's like oh wait there's competition. It's just, yeah, no, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a weird, that, it's a weird uh, season. It's a weird I think season. It's a, I think it's a wake up call season. Cause like you have the weird stuff. You, I think there's a lot of off the, off the course things going for Kristen. We've seen that get to some certain players that I won't mention. Um, you know, she, she had the injury. There's been some weird things. So like, I think this is kind of the wake up call season, but yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely been a little bit of a trend. I, I think you can obviously be concerned and wonder what's going on, but until she's not, the best player in the field. I think she's just still the best player in the field. Yeah. Like, do you think it's, she's playing that much worse, or do you think the field has gotten yes. better? Or do you think it's a combination? I think she's, I think she's playing yeah, worse. Probably a little combo. Yeah, yeah. It, it is tough when you set the bar that high in any she, season. Like she you're lost. always. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying, anytime you you have a historic season like that, looked like what we could expect from Kristen, but maybe that just is the best season of her career and. Well, you know, and to be clear, we can't expect to her to win all four majors every year. Right. Like, it's, tough to, yeah. it's a tough act to follow. It's One per year follow. sounds fair. Yeah. <laughs> oh, statistically, it's interesting, though, too, because she's not, like, really fallen off from a stat perspective. She's still top – she's top ten in everything, and she's top five in – Again, that's not um, – that's not – Well, no, 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 I'm saying it's interesting that she hasn't fallen off statistically, but she's not winning as much. So, like – She's not, she's not finishing tournaments as well, but like the soft skills are all still there. Brody, she, she wasn't a thousand rated last year and this year she is. So isn't she better this year? <laughs> that's, that's a good point, Mike. That is a good point. You can't really argue with that. That's the, those are the solid Listen, The four digits, they mean hey, everything. PGA knows exactly what they're doing with that. I agree. <laughs> they, another, they, another thing to check in the book of the PGA. They control the narrative. They're just going to next like, week. Be, the final question is going to be an AB question about ratings. Keep this up. I don't want to. I don't want to keep <laughs> harping on the PGA, but it was funny this weekend because we had two pools, and it was funny seeing the same score three hours separated with the exact same weather being ten to fifteen points different. Well, yeah, it's almost Mike, like it's almost like the people in the pools are the one that dictates it. Wow. <laughs> now, but Mike, were the were the shadows different? Was the was the True. temperature and different? Someone, I, you gotta and consider these lunch. things. We got it. before it. You gotta Trevor, consider these things, Mike. Trevor, yeah. Trevor, please bring someone on that believes in PJ ratings. Please, the guy who we made need, them, that he told me those things. To my bring him on. Bring him on. He, I think the people them. are ready for one. It's been a while since I've I've been let He's out. Chuck Kennedy. It's been yeah, a while he, since I've been let out about the PJ ratings. All right. All right. Well, maybe we'll talk about ratings. Maybe we'll, we'll do our ratings next week. Maybe. Um, <laughs> but in any case, if you want to suggest your own topics, make sure to scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description. Bunch of great topics submitted last week. Thank you so much for doing that. Continue to do so because we only have a few more weeks left in the season. And um, yeah, we're heading to the playoffs. It's time for the playoffs. Playoffs. See you next week.